Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host, Sri Ayer. Joining me today again after a gap of a few weeks, Rami Niranjan Desaji. You know, she is an author, columnist. She's an expert on Northeast. And we are seeing some disturbing developments in Manipur as well as in Myanmar. We are going to be talking about both these things. May I request all of you to please like this video because this is again one of those videos that will not be liked by many who want all this information suppressed. So our way to counter this is to like, have the like count really high up there so that any bad uh, vibes will be just completely swatted away. Please welcome, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ramiji, please join us. Namaskar, how are you? Namaskar, I'm very well. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. And really, you know, thank you for uh, paying so much of attention to the Northeast and our Northeastern frontier. It, I think, means a lot to people in the Northeast as well as to me as a, you know, as an observer of this region. Ramiji, you know, in the 10 years of Manmohan Singh, they always were looking left, looking right, looking east looking here, looking there. They didn't act on anything. At least the Modi government has tried to act. And, and the fact that there are some projects that are going to be in jeopardy because of what is happening in Mizoram. I mean, I'd like you to take a step back. See, they unseated uh, an elected person on some technicality. This is, I'm talking about uh, uh, Aung Khoi Si. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm, I'm butchering her name. Aung Khoi Si. Sorry, I'm not even going to try it. You can, you can say it. See, okay. from that point forward, the the Myanmar junta has been, you know, having a vice-like grip. What is happening in the last few months? Suddenly, a lot of places it's just coming undone. Um, you know, let me. Uh, that's a good question because that allows me to, you know, explain the situation in entirety. A lot of people wonder why Myanmar is important to us, you know, why are we concentrating so much on what happens internally, is it not their internal affair, but, you know, Myanmar shares 1,643 kilometers of forest borders with the northeastern region. The northeastern region has been used as a base, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, ha has had ethnic groups who have led to separatist movements and have received their training, received arms and ammunition, received ideological support through the roots of Myanmar into China. So, for example, historically, we must have all heard of uh, the Naga insurgency, NSC and IM, NSC and K. These were uh, the longest running separatist secessionist groups in the country. Um, when the Modi government came in, and like you, rightly said, you know, that they paid so much of attention to the Northeast, we tend to forget, you know, because it's been 15 years that they've had a concentrated effort on the Northeast to bring it, uh, you know, to bring it from the isolation that had been created by the Congress. And, you know, there's nobody else to blame, but, you know, the Congress, because they were at the center, they were at many of these states, and their policy was of isolation and exclusion, you know. In the last 15 years, there have been some huge landmark um, you know, uh, steps that have been taken by the Modi government to ensure that the region is brought out of its isolation. Now, one of the steps that was taken was the first agreement that was signed by the Modi government when they came into power was the peace agreement with NSC and IM. Now, why am I you know, talking about NSC and IM is because that's a great example. You know, the longest running secessionist movement, um, the governments, uh, the previous government never made any effort uh, of uh, negotiating with them or having an outreach or having a successful negotiation, at least that, you know. The Modi government did that. Now, NSCN also became a secessionist movement because they used the roots of Myanmar to get their training in China. They had transnational ethnic loyalty. So, you know, uh, as borders were pulled. Borders weren't pulled, keeping in mind that they might be dividing uh, communities that had some uh, uh, sort of relationship or, you know, uh, you know uh, they had some sort of ethnic uh, uh, loyalties. Uh, and of course, that would not have been possible either. But the same thing happened in the Northeast. So you have, for example, you have Nagas on this side and 
you have uh, similar tribes on the other side in Myanmar. So, you know, these loyalties sort of help when uh, uh, terrain, uh, you know, when they need to use the terrain, when they need to use uh, uh, ways to uh, reach or also when they need safety. So when there's a crackdown on this side, you know, they'll be welcomed on the other side. This happened in Tripura also. NLFT was being trained by the ISI in Bangladesh. It is only after when, when Sheikh Hasina came in that there was a crackdown and they, you know, uh, people that we were looking for, operatives of the NLFT were handed back to us. You know, so therefore, countries across the border are very, very important for us to not just have diplomatic relations, to have good relations, but also uh, to ensure that uh, we can have an outreach wherein we can help out in any way possible to have stable neighbors is very important for us. Now, when we talk about Myanmar, Myanmar, you know, has been in a flux after the military coup. Uh, a lot of people will argue that even under the democratic government, it wasn't really completely peaceful because Myanmar has a lot of different ethnic communities who have their own aspirations. A lot of these ethnic communities, majority of them, have been uh, have what is called ethnic, uh, uh, you know, arm, armed groups, uh, EOs. You know, uh, these are groups within these ethnic communities who have become armed um, to be able to. Well, at least this is the ask. You know, is to be able to. Um, fight for the aspirations of these ethnic communities. The Bamars, who are the ruling dispensation, uh, a lot of these other ethnic communities feel do not care about their aspirations. Now, this obviously was the initial intention of these ethnic armed organizations to come up. But as usual, as you will understand, your viewers have watched a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, you know your work and therefore they know geostrategic uh, issues that they'll understand that you know a lot of these uh, uh, militant groups separatist groups secessionist groups whatever you may want to call them insurgent groups do not usually uh, live by the intention that they started in you know so they started as groups that were to be representative of the aspirations of their ethnic communities eventually it turns into more like mafia-like, extortion-like insurgent groups. And uh, that is what the junta, uh, the military dispensation at this point, is dealing with. See, it's been three years since the military coup in Myanmar. And after three years, we've seen something that we've never seen before. And this is the launch of a very organized operation, Operation 1027, which is named after uh, the date that the operation was launched. This is last year, 2023, uh, October 27, therefore 1027. And it was launched by the military junta. And for the first time, we have seen such a coordinated uh, uh, grouping of different insurgent groups. So the Three Brotherhood Alliance is what it was called, uh, which comprised of the Arakan Army, which is based in the Rakhine state, uh, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, MNDA, uh, which is from the Kokang region uh, of Shan state, and the Tang National Liberation Army, also from the Shan state. Uh, this was a very successful operation that was led by this Three Brotherhood Alliance. And this sort of coordination, this sort of uh, usage of weapons, we haven't seen before. Um, and they attacked, uh, uh, you know, all three of them together attacked military outposts, police stations, and took control over key cities and highways uh, throughout the regions that, you know, the Shan state that they were operating in. And then it moved to Saigang region, which is across India's border. Uh, and there was Aviji, a lot if of... I, if I might interject just for one moment, one moment. I please, see a please. big... I see a big hint in the name, Operation 1027. You look at the way India writes the date. You look at the way the British wrote the date, month first or date first. 
So here <laughs> it is month first. I'm seeing a big hint here. I'm seeing a very big hint as to who thought of this idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. I had missed out on that, so I am glad that you pointed that out. But you know, uh, please, please feel free to interject whenever you want, because you know these are complex regions, these are complex situations, you know. And I'm very happy to explain it in whatever way possible, because we must be aware about what is happening on our northeastern borders. You know, as you would uh, also agree that we've had a lot of concentration on the northwestern border. You know, our northwestern frontier, because of the vested interest, Pakistan is there, the U.S. has had vested interest there. You know, it's diverted all our attention. We call that the great game West. But actually, this is the great game East that is being played out. And we are not paying attention to this. So please do feel free to interject. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I was talking about 1027, but it isn't just 1027 because it was such a successful operation against the junta because so many military outposts fell. And mind you, you know, military outposts, what does it mean by police stations or military outposts falling? You know, it doesn't just mean that, oh, they've taken control. That also means that they've got control of all their assets. You know, they've got control of all the weapons that are housed here. They have controls of all the maps. They, you know, and uh, taking controls over major city and highways. Again, these are transit routes. These are the routes that the junta would take if they wanted to send in reinforcements, you know. So these are very, very important uh, developments that have taken place, you know. Um, the rebellion also, like I said, I was saying that uh, moved to the Saigang region on the 6th of November. And uh, the Saigang region is across uh, uh, the northeastern uh, border. And uh, the biggest city fell there called Kaolin. Uh, into the hands of the, you know, ethnic armed uh, organizations. And uh, that became the first district level town to be taken. So, you know, this really raised a lot that, of... That's in idols. Shan State, right? That's in Shan State. This is Kaolin. This is Saigal. You know, this is okay, another okay. state. First, uh, district level state that fell. Uh, by the 7th of November, because these operations were so, uh, you know, were so uh, successful, Another operation was launched. It was Operation 1107, uh, which was in support of Operation 1027. And 100% I know who's behind all this, Ramiji. 1107? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and, you know, if, if our viewers, uh, uh, you know, I'd encourage our viewers to look at the political map of Myanmar. And you'll realize, you know, that all the states, all the states have insurgent groups. All the, you know, there are a lot of states that have multiple border connections to the Northeast, but um, the, all the other insurgent groups joined hands, you know, uh, uh, with Operation 1027 being launched in support of 1107. Um, there were more insurgent groups than you can count on both your hands that joined hands to uh, fight against the junta. You know, a lot of the insurgent groups that have nothing in common with each other also found this as a space to counter the junta so that, uh, you know, they could possibly make their own power play. And this is really one of the rare occasions in the troubled history of Myanmar where such a variety of ethnic groups have come together, you know, for this uh, simultaneous attack. Now, we must also understand that there are these groups called the People's Defense Forces, PDF. You know, so apart from all the ethnic groups, these are militia groups that have branched out of the National Unity Government. Now, you'll ask what the National Unity Government is. You know, NUG has also joined the fray of this operations. The NUG is almost like the government in exile. And they're, you know, they have un an unstinted support of the US. And this, su this support has also resulted in their office being uh, a stone's thrown throw away from the White House. Uh, the NUG is in constant contact with uh, uh, the US uh, officials who are looking at Burma. And the NUG also welcomed the, Bur the Burma Unified Through Rigorous Military Accountability Act of 2022. Um, you know, and we must understand that this name, Burma itself, is provocated 
to the junta because the junta calls itself Myanmar. Uh, till the Obama dispensation, Obama used to call it both, you know, Myanmar and Burma as to keep a balance. But the Biden administration has gone all out to not just reprimand the junta, but also to uh, ensure that there is support to the forces that are trying to overthrow the junta. You know, the act was passed last year and, uh, you know, this is not just the only country that is doing it, the UK, US also have alienated the junta. Um, you know, there was also, uh, you know, uh, the US Senate as a part of the US National Defense Authorization Act, you know, had also supported the NUG and other ethnic uh, forces and uh, had tried to prevent the junta from getting access to weapons and, you know, getting support internationally. You know, but we have to again look at this, you know, uh, from our point of view, from India's point of view, this sort of interference, sanction, there have been over 26 rounds of sanctions between the UK, US, US and the EU on Myanmar. You know, all of this um, interference in Myanmar, which is, by the way, uh, nowadays being called the sacrifice zone, Associated Press News had done a, a article on Myanmar, um, where they called it the sacrifice zone because they said, you know, Myanmar is one of the four countries where critical earth mining is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, allowed and, uh, you know, there is enough of it. And, you know, the West's need to turn to, you know, to transition to green technologies is making Myanmar a sacrifice zone because nobody cares about Myanmar. The militias are controlling all this mining. And over and above that, now with the junta coming in, the U.S. and the Western powers are putting in more sanctions. Now, what, is these, what are these sanctions going to do? You know, and this is the crux of the matter. This, the sanctions are going to drive Myanmar towards China. You know, these Western policies have encouraged uh, Myanmar to also look towards not just China, but also Russia for support. And uh, with Myanmar's major source of foreign investment being China, with 40% of its foreign debt owed to China, you know, any sort of problems in Myanmar, any sort of conflict in Myanmar is going to give China a backdoor entry, which it is waiting for. You have to understand China also has a lot of assets in Myanmar. They have gas and oil pipelines, you know, they're looking for an entry into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, they already have access to... Cocoa Islands, uh, right? Cocoa Islands. Why? Absolutely, you know, uh, which is almost, I think, only about 55 kilometers away from the Andamans. Not saying that India is not keeping an eye on it. We're doing a brilliant job, you know. But, you know, the fact of the matter is this is becoming a very complex, complex situation. Um, we've seen what has happened in Manipur. Manipur has been in a state of conflict. Obviously, there have been peaks and it's come down and so on and so forth. But... Um, since last May 2023 and before that we'd seen little sparks of you know conflict come up and it emanated into this huge conflict in May and then post that uh, you know it went on you know quite severely for many many months but even as of now it's only yesterday that Kuldeep Singh the security advisor the um, uh, uh, the gentleman who's commanding uh, you know, all the forces in Manipur at this time in a press conference said that we have PDFs coming in from Myanmar to aid militants in Manipur. You know, now this is what happens when your neighbors are unstable. This is what happens when uh, uh, you have uh, anti-national vested interests operating within your country who can get support from um, uh, from uh, militant groups across um, the border. And this is further encouraged by transnational ethnic loyalties. You know, groups of one ethnic group, you know, will reach out to, let's say, their cousin groups who, you know, are across the border for some sort of support. You know, now I've written two articles on this in the Open Magazine, and I had forewarned at that point of you know, not just the international vested interest and interference in Myanmar for the northeastern region, but the brunt of 
illegal immigrants, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree with me that you know refugees are not illegal immigrants. You know, we want to use this word refugee and garner support and sympathy, but you know, refugees are listed in some sort of documentation. Illegal immigrants aren't, and illegal immigrants can pose a huge problem for us because not just does it impact the demographic change, and the Northeast has seen massive demographic change, and unfortunately, it was completely ignored by the previous dispensation. On the contrary, I'll go as far as to say that it was encouraged. You know, there cannot be the kind of demographic change that we've seen in Assam, we've seen in a lot of these states, without. Um, you know, some sort of complicit support or without, you know, with without complete, uh, you know, uh, ignorance uh, of these areas. Uh, in Manipur also, one of the reasons for the conflict was illegal immigrants. And they've been saying this for a very long time. Observers have been saying this from the beginning of the conflict that, you know, we've seen, people on ground have seen uh, Myanmar-based insurgents shoot at our forces or shoot at our civilians, you know, uh, and you can tell because of the languages are different, the clothes that they wear are different. Um, but people have refused to accept this because, you know, there's this sort of sympathy that goes for, you know, somebody coming out of a conflict state, but everybody coming out of a conflict state is not a displaced person. You know, they could be, uh, you know, they could be mercenaries. Um, but also, you know, th these are the roots and this is how illegal weapons and the drug trade takes hold you know because it is the drug trade it is uh, the distribution of weapon the uh, uh, illegal weapons market that fuels and funds a lot of these militia groups you know so this has far reaching consequences on not just the northeast but on the national security of india and india's ambitions of the actis policy wherein the root is from Myanmar. We've invested heavily in the trilateral highway. We've invested heavily in the Kaladan multimodal project. And, you know, I believe you have a map of the Kaladan multimodal project, you know, which is very interesting to look at because, you know, if you look at the map, uh, you see the Kolkata to Sitwe uh, uh, sea route, which is 539 kilometers. Now that has already become operational you know uh, uh, and you know why is this important the kaladan multimodal project is important because unfortunately the british were absolutely rubbish at cartography they didn't know how to draw maps look at how mainland india is connected to the northeastern region through a 22 kilometer wide chicken's neck which is also called the siliguri corridor you know uh, it's a 22 kilometer uh, a wide uh, landmass, which puts our connectivity, it not only makes it expensive, but it puts it in a precarious position. So therefore, it is very important for us to have a second route. Now, that second route uh, is this, you know, because it's a multimodal project, so it crosses the sea route, and then it goes up uh, through a land route uh, into uh, Mizoram and further and this is what makes it very interesting because uh, just look at the potential of it you know of course you know it's a very ambitious project and nobody ever thought that it would be easy because these areas are uh, you know troubled areas historically uh, it crosses through uh, the Chin state you know uh, and recently this is only a couple of days ago if you look at the map uh, Paleva Paleva also has a, a little uh, inland uh, port there, you know, so it's very, very crucial. Uh, so if you look at Paleva, Paleva fell into the hands of the militia. Now, from Paleva to Kaleva, it's, you know, only about 60, 70 kilometers. And from Kaleva, uh, it's really to our border, it's only about 50 kilometers. Um, there is also work that has already happened here. Uh, infrastructure building has already happened to make this route functional. We've invested money. This was supposed to be our alternate route to our chicken's neck problem. And it has fallen into the hands of the militia. 
and you know now you know it wasn't as if as if we hadn't thought that this would happen you know anybody observing this would know that they would take up all the you know if militias have a free hand they would take all the strategic cities they would take all the strategic uh, uh, infrastructures uh, we've already seen that happen before you know they've taken uh, 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 you know, they've taken right across the Manipur border. Um, there is uh, the Kale Tamu Road in Kampa town. Uh, this is hugely important for us because More, which is where in Manipur, the last uh, week you will see there's been a rise, more than a week, there's been a rise in uh, conflict. You know, the Manipur conflict had gone down and it's starting to uh, get messy again. You know, so uh, last uh, uh, few weeks, we've seen a rise. Uh, we've even had uh, poor commandos die. We've had uh, Manipur police uh, officers be shot dead, you know, uh, in More. And More is the town in Manipur that opens up to Myanmar and Southeast Asia. So More was going to be our, um, if Northeast is our gateway, to our ambitions in uh, Southeast Asia, More is our, you know, literal road to Southeast Asia. And More is where this problem is happening today. And uh, Kale Tamu Road is just across More. So Tamu is the closest town, you know, uh, on the Myanmar side that uh, we have to take to uh, fulfill our ambitions of our Actis policy. And this town was taken by the militia, I think, on the seventh uh, of November, and therefore, you know, Paleva uh, uh, falling. Uh, it's hugely, hugely important because now we are seeing uh, very strategic towns across the border, strategic assets where India has investments being taken. Uh, of course, other towns have also been taken. Uh, this is not the only one. As a matter of fact, uh, by the admission of uh, very senior members of the junta, uh, uh, the acting president, uh, General Min of the junta, uh, it's also been said that Myanmar is on the verge of breaking up because it's almost like the militias now have control over more strategic assets and cities than the junta does. You know, for example, you know, this, like I'm saying, that this also has, you know, multi layer repercussions for us. We also have the Chin National Force, CNA, which has taken up Paleva, which has taken up Rekhodar in uh, Palam Township, uh, which has taken up Kale Tamu uh, Road and Kamfat Town that I was talking about. Um, we have to understand CNF is the Chin National Force. You know, it is. Uh, an extremely dangerous militia group that operates in the Chin state and has transnational ethnic loyalties in Mizoram, in Manipur. You must have noticed during the Manipur conflict, we had many, many different nomenclatures that were being used. There was the cookies, you know, there were the Chins, there were the Zos, you know, so these are... Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we must question ourselves, are they cookie, are they chin, what is zo, why are there so many names, you know? And that is because, you you know, uh, uh, cookies are what we call these tribes, this side, chin is what they're called, that side, you know, all these, uh, all these titles are larger umbrella names. So, you know, a tribe can be multiple sub-tribes as well. A tribe can have multiple loosely connected relations to other tribes as well. Now, during the colonial times, during the British era, an umbrella term was given for them to understand things better. So, for example, Nagas, you know, who, who we call Nagas today, is not one homogeneous tribe. It's 16 plus tribes, you know, and sub-tribes that have brought together, that have been brought together under the umbrella of the word Naga. Um, because they had some interconnectivity, you know. But when the British entered Naga areas, a lot of these tribes didn't even speak the same language. Yes, they may have had some linguistic relationships, but they didn't even speak the same language. So the British gave them a language, gave them an umbrella term, and this idea of one unified tribe came together 
very recently, post the British. The same thing with the cookies, with the chins. They are not one homogeneous tribes. You know, there are multiple sub tribes under it. You know, there'll be the Pethis, there'll be the Thados, you know. Uh, some tribes are bigger, some tribes are smaller, some tribes are considered more senior, some tribes are considered junior tribes. Now, they were given this umbrella term, whether you call it cookie, whether you call it chin. And that is where they find their ethnic loyalties. Now, let me be very, very clear here. When I talk about transnational ethnic loyalties, we must not blanket color the entire tribe because there are many, many, many people within the cookies, within the chains, you know, uh, who have great national loyalties, you know, who oppose this sort of illegal immigration that is coming from across the border and who oppose um, any sort of interference, international interference into our internal affairs. However, you know, I have noticed two problems. One is that it becomes very difficult for a nationalist, reasonable, rational voice to come up and say, we oppose this sort of illegal immigration because within these communities, there are militia groups. And these militia groups, these insurgent groups demand complete and utter loyalty. You know, so rational voices find it difficult to come up. And therefore, we see very far and few speaking you know, in uh, uh, in opposition to, you know, these uh, militias coming in from Myanmar, these illegal immigrants who are also involved in the drug trade coming in from Myanmar. Uh, however, you know, it would not be right for us to completely color a complete community. But like I said, the Chin National Force, uh, which works on the other side of Myanmar, has taken these strategic towns that are across Mizoram, are across Manipur. By their own admission, the CNA spokesperson, Salai uh, Ni, described uh, Rikodo, um, the, the, the city that, uh, you know, one of the important cities that they've taken across uh, 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 Mizoram, Manipur. Uh, he called it one of the most important outposts uh, for trade with India. He noted that and said it's uh, only a very short distance from uh, another town called Zokhatar, which is in Mizoram. You know, so they also are uh, looking at this, in my opinion, as a larger agenda. You know, wherein uh, they might want to bring together areas that have majority of the same uh, of these same communities. And that is very dangerous for us because, again, let me take the example of the Naga insurgency. When, you know, the demand and the insurgency was not just merely an insurgency, it became a secessionist movement. Their demand was for all of Nagaland, parts of Manipur, parts of Assam, parts of Arunachal Pradesh, and of course, parts of Myanmar to make a separate country, which would be called Nagalim, and that would be called Nagalim for Christ because it would be a Christian country between India and Myanmar. So this sort of aspiration for a, a, for a, a, a separate nation is not new to this region. You know, it's not new. Uh, also, this sort of secessionist movement bases religion, bases ethnic identity, even if that may be a forged ethnic identity, is not new to this region and basis this example this living example you know we are forced to think about the larger grander designs that may be in the works here you know um, let me also bring to your note sir that uh, all of these areas uh, are not these are not just some random insurgent groups who are running around with some second hand weapons no even in Manipur, in the last week, we've seen homemade RPGs being used against our forces. We've seen ammunition being made at home. The Chin National Army on the Myanmar East side and the PDFs who are now, you know, who are from the Myanmar East side, who now, by the admission of our intelligence, are also operating in Manipur, have very state of the art uh, weapons. You know, recently, uh, 
uh, the CNA and the PDFs were aided by, they have a drone team and it's called the Thanglang uh, the drone team, which uh, has access to drones, not because they bought it from somewhere, because they've got commercially available parts and they put these drones together because nowadays on the internet, you can find designs for anything. So they're using MR-10 cargo drones, which is also used by a lot of big armies across the world, you know, and uh, to add to their strategically, very, very strategically captured uh, uh, towns and military installations, um, you know, they've taken control over military camps as well. So you'll see videos around uh, 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 of these groups that are taking over these towns across the border of Mizoram and Manipur, who are taking control of the huge cache of state-of-the-art weapons that the junta had, junta being the military, you know, that the junta had. And that, again, makes it hugely dangerous for us because these weapons can come across the border, which, again, we've been saying that, you know, they already have. And um, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, yesterday, I think over 270. Oh, um, well, well, one second, Ramiz. Can we have the map back, please? I was, I was going to have a few questions for you. I was waiting mm -hmm. for you to take a pause so that I could interject mm -hmm. a question or two. Please, <laughs> please. Just stop me in the yeah. middle. <laughs> so, okay. so this, if you look at this thing, Sitwa port is in Myanmar, right? Sitwa? Yeah. So, so essentially we are doing an end run around Bangladesh here. Yes. So Kalan, Kalandi, uh, Kaladan, sorry, Kaladan multimodal transit comes into Sitwa port and then there is the river Kaladan. So the goods basically, if you have the right size of the ship, they can navigate mm -hmm. all the way up to Paleva. And then from there, there is, I think, a road that goes up to Ayajal, maybe 200 kilometers max. Now, with Absolutely. Paleva being, and Paleva falling in the hands of these uh, militia groups, essentially, it's a choke point. My question is, I know United States is trying to limit the influence of China everywhere. Here, this national unity government does it also have Aung Su Kyi in that? It has all the democratic forces. It's a loosely tied government. It also has a, you know, it also has a cabinet wherein it has a Rohingya minister, you know. And mind you, these are also the areas, you know, when we talk about the Rakhine state. Uh, let me also bring to your note that these are also areas where ARSA works from. ARSA is the Arakan uh, uh, Rohingya Salvation Army. And we know the problems that we've had with ARSA, uh, you know, where, wherein we talk about the U.S. ambitions in these areas. We've seen the interference in Bangladesh. We've seen, we've seen that they were fully involved in terms of, you know, there was even a joke that I think uh, the envoy, Peter Haas, went so many times to the election commission office that uh, the locals in Bangladesh used to say, he'll only fight an election, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, there were sanctions also put on Bangladesh. Um, and I don't think it's been lost on anybody that they really weren't keen that Sheikh Hasina comes back under this stance of we want democracy. And of course, who doesn't want democracy? You know, they were they were maybe, uh, uh, you know, supporting uh, a BNP to come in. Now, this becomes a problem because this is... BNP had problem. a huge representative in, in the Washington, D.C. area, Ramiji. It was none other than Hunter Biden. These guys <laughs> had gone and <laughs> hired Hunter Biden as their spokesperson. You know, you this is Papa is going to listen to the whole Department of State or his son? You know, sir, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the U.S. understands what they're playing with. You know, the minute you support radicals, if the BNP comes in tomorrow, you know, the Jamaat right now by uh, the Supreme Court order is not allowed to contest. But, you know, there will be a time with this sort of tacit support, there will be a time that they will bring these guys in, you know, if there isn't any sort of intervention. And that's going to be a big problem. Same with Myanmar, you know, you can support the NUG as much as you want. NUG is just asked for $500 million from the US, $250 for, for non-lethal intervention, you know, and I'd like to see what the rest of the money is for. But the fact of the matter is, uh, as much as I would also like to see democracy and I'd like to see democratically elected countries across the world, um, 
uh, and stable countries. My question is that with so many different ethnic aspirations and ambitions, which were not accommodated when the uh, democratic government was in power, will they be able to accommodate those aspirations under the NUG or not? And if they are not, will this become a bigger mess of different, different nationalistic aspirations propping up, which will make it a bigger problem for us in the Northeast and, um, you know, bring China to our back door because China already is playing the role of mediator amongst many of these groups. So they already have inroads. You know, they played like this sort of, you know, we'll support the junta also, and we'll support the insurgent groups that are against the junta also, and we'll use them as and when as we want. And uh, we will be negotiators also. If you look at China, China has been trying to play the part of a mediator which any big influencing power does more often than not in all the last conflicts across the world. You know, therefore, China will do that here as well. And when, you know, there is a dead trap history that China follows in a lot of these countries, why do we feel that that will not happen in Bangladesh or that will not happen in Myanmar? You know, so the US doesn't understand the complexities or it chooses to overlook it or and i say this with a lot of responsibility or while it also extends a hand of friendship to india through these uh, interventions in our neighboring countries it is also on the other hand trying to contain india you know so absolutely this is uh, ramiji ramiji i have to i have to uh, I'm too many questions in my head so i have to stop you here i'm Please. so sorry i may not be able to and, answer and you... all of them but <laughs> i'll try my best <laughs> no no this is an opinion question more than anything else 1970-71 genocide the u.s embassy is screaming at the top of its voice that there is ethnic cleansing going on there is genocide going on here that you need to act what does the u.s do it goes and backs Pakistan, right? And 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 at least the the, the ambassador resigned out of disgust. I heard that the, I can't just see this thing. I can't take this thing anymore. Now you have all these people like Peter Haas, Eric Garcetti, and 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 I don't remember the name of the uh, the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan. I want uh, I'm going to put some person people on the spot here from the Department of State. This is all you know. The kitchen is Department of State. I have no doubt about that. that. There are only three or four double quote specialists. I'll ask you names. You can say yes, no, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, let, yes. let's start with let's start with the chief plotter, Victoria <laughs> Newland. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uzra Zaya. Yes, yes. I'm going to say she, yes to all. <laughs> she went to Bangladesh, strutted about there, started talking about this lack of democracy, and then immediately, you know, the, it just starts going up the chain. You know, Uzra Zaya, these are all, you know, characterless clowns because she is of Bihari Indian, uh, Bihari American parents. Her parents are from Bihar. And, and she is now a self styled expert. And US is so dumb, dumb asses. I have to say this thing. The Department of State is full of hubris and dumbasses. You tell me, guys. I mean, if you think that I'm getting under your skin, Department of State, I know you guys are all closely watching this. You are getting a tongue lashing here. What is what is your aim here? You want to restore democracy in Myanmar. And at the same time, you want to control India as well as China. Wouldn't it be better if you at least try to make one side win a little bit so that the, the, the prosperity, that, that trade route for India is so important. It's like a lifeline there. And More is the place where everything opens out to, and you go and put, uh, you know, um, arms there. And, and US, I tell you, it is a, it's a total mess. I still can't tell you with an honest face who is running this government. Is it Obama still? Because it was Obama until Susan Rice got kicked out in April last year. And the next day, Biden announces that he's running again. 
suddenly this guy woke up and said, oh my God, somebody else is, you know, the orders used to be 180 degrees countermanded before that. What, this One guy would say one thing, exact opposite will happen the next day. So that tells you that there were multiple centers of power in US. And, and the US may not like the other world to know, but maybe US has been doing this for a long time. But now with social media and a lot of inquiring minds, it is getting harder and harder to play its game, I guess. But my question to you, I'm sorry to say all these things. I just <laughs> see the disingenuousness of the United States. You, you want your kind of uh, you, you want your kind of democracy. Excuse me, your democracy itself is in tatters right now. I'm sorry, I'm telling, I'm addressing the department. No, I agree with you. I, I actually said this somewhere. I said, you know, where where are you virtue signaling, uh, you know, democracy to us? Wherein, whether you like Trump or not, look at the witch hunt. You know, just to keep him away from elections. You know, it's yes. shocking view. It could never happen in India. You know, so, uh, you know, this sort of virtue signaling has always been a part of their, you know, grander game. And let me also bring in another note here, you know, uh, NSCN also, when they wanted this greater Nagalim, and it was for Christ, you know, there was a lot of uh, US state support for this aspiration because you have to understand these regions are very important for the US. So it's not just about them being confused. It might be them being over smart because having a region in this area, that is a Christian region. You don't have a Christian region in this area. You don't have a Christian nation in this area. Could give them that sort of uh, tactical support base foundation wherein they feel that they could use to counter all these countries, especially China. You know, uh, when, uh, when uh, the negotiations early on post-independence were happening with uh, these secessionist groups, uh, you know, NSCN, uh, also with, uh, you know, to counter this idea of greater Nagaland. Um, it was Reverend Michael Scott, who, if you please, uh, an American who was uh, uh, trying to, who was appointed to negotiate uh, with the government of India uh, from the side of the, uh, of the insurgent groups, of the separatists. It was only found out later while this was happening that um, he was actually even speaking to the Chinese. He was actually more in favor of a separate state. And one of the moves in that time, Nehru was uh, prime minister. One of the moves that was making, uh, taken was to uh, ask him to leave the country. Uh, very little uh, intervention, but at least there was an intervention. At least they did find out about him. So we have to also look at it. Even when the British were leaving India, they had this great plan called the Kuplan Plan, which was the Crown Colony Plan, wherein they wanted to keep the Northeast and parts of Myanmar under direct control. Luckily, that plan didn't work out. But you have to ask yourself, why is it that over and over again, there is this game being played in this region? Why is it that there has been such massive conversion and, uh, you know, conversion to Christianity? And, uh, you know, what is the larger agenda? A lot of times when I think about it, uh, for me, I keep coming back to this, that the larger agenda is there isn't a Christian base in this region. And that Christian base is necessary for the West to have, to have their foundations, you know, and to become stakeholders here. Um, Ramiji, I don't know how much you know about this, but over a period of 40, 50 years, South Korea has been converted from Buddhism to Christianity. Correct, correct. correct. South Korea, and, and, you know, correct, please go on. And, and uh, the, the problem is that they, they seamlessly go back and forth. I mean, they, they still up, appear to follow Sanatana Dharma, Buddhist customs and things like that. After all, the royalty, you know, lineage dates back to uh, Rama, Kausal, Kushal king, because one princess from here went and married into the South Korean uh, dynasty kings yes. there. Uh, and uh, in fact, you would be surprised to know that they've also had uh, uh, Southern Indian, South Indian princesses oh. marrying into the South Korean kingdom. Because in South Korea, in, in Korean language, uh, the, the term used to address mom and dad 
is what is in in Tamil, Amma and Appa. There, there are all these connections. Lots of language, yeah. lots of words in Tamil in in Korean. No, there have always been all these connections. Uh, whether it's Thailand, whether it's Cambodia, you know, whether it's the Khmer Empire, whether it's Vietnam, you know, right up till Japan. Um, Saraswati and Ganesha are part of their pantheon of gods, you know. Um, so there, you know, the the outreach of uh, the Hindu religion, Sanatan Dharma, uh, even if it is now in more of a diluted way, still exists. There is no denying that. However, what happens in areas, even Myanmar, let me tell you, the unifier of Myanmar was King Aniruddha. You know, uh, Myanmar also was... Uh, uh, many different tribes and many different uh, principalities. And the first time Myanmar was unified was under King Anirudh. And this is not this is not an isolated case. There have been many kingdoms. Uh, there have been Hindu kingdoms before transitioning into Buddhism. Uh, the names of cities, which later were changed, uh, uh, you know, have come from our uh, history of Mahabharata and Ramayana. You know, so this has been. The general, you know, in Southeast Asia, therefore, when we say that an act-east policy is important, it's not just important because of trade and commerce, but it's also the soft power of bringing our cultural and historical ancient linkages together. And what natural root then Myanmar? But let me also bring in another point here. You see, all these areas, unlike South uh, Korea, are tribal areas. They're hugely tribal, Northeast, Myanmar. These are tribal populations. These populations only started transiting from being tribal, you know, to uh, adopting mainstream religions like Christianity uh, only with the advent of the colonialists. And one of the reasons that it was very important, and this I know because of my archival studies, because of the uh, letters and communication I have found between the missionaries and the British, is because they saw these people as pagans, barbarians, and savages. So it became a moral duty for them to convert, and it became a moral duty for them. They also have written this in their communication that uh, it's not just about uh, it's not just about it's a you know through conversion we will also be able to give them a sense of nationhood because uh, they are tribal communities, the pagans. Uh, the sense of nationhood is very nascent. You know, so basically what they were saying that, look, you know, instead of integrating them or uh, pushing the civilizational continuity that, you know, there is in the Northeast, there is in all these countries. See, the civilizational community, a uh, continuity is huge because there still are, you know, tribals in these communities that believe that they are descendants of Rukmini, they are descendants of Chitrangada, they are descendants of Ghatotkaj, they are even descendants of Bali, you know, so... Uh, instead of reminding them or strengthening this civilizational continuity, they said, look, they don't understand nationhood right now. Let's convert them. Let's give them a new religion and let's give them a new sense of nationhood. So in these areas, it becomes more precarious because now these tribal communities have forgotten their ancient civilizational continuity, giving them a sense of new nationhood, even in this Manipur conflict even with what is happening, you know, uh, with the connection of what is happening in Myanmar. Just like the idea of greater Nagalem, sir, there is also the idea of greater Zalingam that the Chin tribes are promoting. This greater Zalingam wants all of Mizoram, parts of Mani uh, uh, Manipur and parts of Myanmar to make a greater nation. So if Chin militant groups take over these strategic areas, do you think the next step will not be wanting areas from India? That be and very, very, uh, it's a very, very scary proposition. But this Dalingam is very much like the idea of Nagalim. And this is in my, this is the secessionist agenda that I feel when we look at these strategic towns being captured by the CNA, when we look at them being across our country, when we look at these strategic assets where India has put money in being taken over. This is where our mind should go. Very true. And and uh, Ramiji, with your permission, uh, we can conclude and, and then we can Absolutely. take some questions. You've been Absolutely. speaking nonstop for close to 50 minutes. I'm sure your throat is running dry. If you want to take a sip of water, please, please feel free. I'm fine. Uh, Thank you. 
I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, uh, so, shall we go for questions now? Yes, I mean, we, we still have an evolving situation here. Paleva is a very critical cog in the wheel. And I'm sure, you know, that is something that the Indian government knows. 40,000 refugees have come into Manipur in the last couple of weeks alone. And, Sir, and that these is are again... About. I'm sorry? That is only what we know about. Yes, that's only what we know about. Yes, documented. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, again... I, I don't know, I can't quite put my finger, but the names like Operation 1027, Operation 1107, dead giveaways as to who is sitting in which table and chair in your Department of State in Washington, D.C. and coming up with all these names. Guys, put some thought into it. You want to hide your tracks, put some intelligence. Okay? We can catch you. Anyway, I'm going to go to town on this on Twitter. That's okay. <laughs> First question from, uh, let's take some questions, please. Kaiser Soze wants to know, in order to prevent weapon smuggling by Kuku militant, Kuki militants from Myanmar, should India consider setting up a buffer zone between its border and that of Myanmar? It's difficult, isn't it? Terrain doesn't allow that. Sir, I don't think a buffer zone would, be, uh, would contain this. Uh, also, a buffer zone would mean uh, land. That and uh, tribal communities hold land very dear to them. This is a, a point of no go, no negotiation. So I don't think a buffer zone will help. Um, these are also very porous borders. These are highly forested borders. It's very very difficult. Next one, please. Magnet Ranga wants to know, Jay Sri Ram. While it is great to see Northeast being really recognized now. Unfortunately, many of our enemies are bordering any. What more, according to you, can the government do to bring in peace? Very good question. You know, I, you know, I actually am going to enjoy answering this question because let me start from the fact that it's not just the government. You know, in areas like this, it is the people. And it's not just the people who live in these areas, who live in the Northeast, but it's the people who live outside it as well. For many, many years, decades, we have ignored this area. If you ask an average Indian anything about the Northeast, ask them to name the seven states and one brother state, they will not be able to do that, let alone un have deeper understanding about uh, tribal communities, their culture, their heritage, their rich uh, literature. We would have not read anything. It becomes our national duty to know about this more, you know, uh, the more Sir, like I always say to you that, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that you have taken so much of time to, you know, bring me on, bring other people on who speak on the Northeast, you know, so as to make people aware. This is the kind of intervention we need. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart because we find that, let's say, you know, we have articles on the Northeast. They do the least amount of circulation because nobody is interested. We have problems in the Northeast. The news doesn't cover it. If the news covers it, it only covers it when there's conflict. You know, and that also it will cover it in piecemeal. You know, whereas if there's a conflict in Punjab, if there's a conflict in Jammu and Kashmir, it will make headlines. Until and unless this news, this information becomes valuable, the government cannot do anything because the government also has its own limitations. Now, in this situation, you know, uh, people might say, oh, the government, the security forces should uh, have a crackdown. How do you do a crackdown when a lot of these people are uh, your own civilians? You are in fear of alienating them. And you already, the previous dispensations have alienated them because they've never paid any attention to them. So one of the grievances that you hear in the Northeast is nobody cares about us in India. You know, we are isolated. You know, this is the reason. So I think what has to what has to happen is we ourselves have to become more interested in this region we ourselves have to mainstream it thank you so much next question please victor tongbra wants to know rami ji can you please explain about mekalo's policy adopted by central government um you know this is a question that you might as well read online uh, it's a you know uh, macaulay is you know i think uh, uh, we've spoken a lot about him. We know everything about him. So this is, right, I right, would not right. waste my time talking about this. Next one, please. 
Mangat Ranga again, Jai Sri Ram. What is the fate of Aung San Suu Kyi? In the midst of all turmoil, she seems to be forgotten. We just talked about it. She's an NUG, right? Yeah. yeah. She's also getting older. So again, nothing much to talk about, you know. Vidyanan Tokcham wants to know. So in this Manipur situation, Metis are irrelevant or pawns for the larger picture? Metis, uh, no community is irrelevant. You know, why should the Metis be irrelevant? Uh, there's nothing about uh, them being a pawn in any picture. You know, I think this is a conflict between two communities, uh, which has been, which has been uh, fueled by a lot of what's happening in Myanmar, uh, which I've just explained, you know. Uh, so I don't think the Metis are pawns in anything. Um, I think this is a very unfortunate situation that has cropped up. Vidyanan, they, they see in India, Indian government has acted to try and curb the pop, you know pop, uh, poppy cultivation in India's borders. Within India only it can act. It cannot act outside of India. We know Shan state is one of the largest producers of opium crop. And, and that has to get processed somewhere. And, and one of the mistakes that India did, my, in my opinion, Ramiji, you feel free to disagree with. We are done with questions. I just had this one last uh, parting thought. 1971. I don't know if you have read this book called Cowboys by B. Raman. K A O B O Y S. Ah, of course, yes. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. It's a great book. He, he, he says that raw functioned brilliantly in the formation of Bangladesh. Then he says, for some inexplicable reason, the entire operation, the entire group was wound up by Indira Gandhi. And that paved way for the ISI to come back in. I'm talking about 71, having won the war. I, I can't imagine why India would just give up 93,000 soldiers, not even ask the 150 Indian soldiers who are in prison in Pakistan. Not and even negotiate. No they could have negotiated for so much. They could have sorted out the Jammu Kashmir problem in return. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so here is the thing. There is an interview by Field Marshal Sam Manekshan. It's available on YouTube, guys. You can, you can listen to this. Because he was a man he spoke, who spoke his mind. <laughs> so, after this thing, 93,000 soldiers have gone back. Everything Bhutto gets. Then uh, he goes and <laughs> asks Indira Gandhi, why did you give away the whole thing? Then she says, you know, Bhutto was so convincing. He said, it's only six months since I got power. I need to look good in the eyes of my people. So please help me out. And he listens to her patiently and then says, Madam, he has made a monkey out of you. <laughs> you, know, you know, some of our policies, you know, for a very long time were absolutely, you know, I, I don't know what they were thinking, you know, because I, I look at it from the point of view of the Northeast. And it was almost like you wanted it to go. You know, so, uh, you know, these are questions that I'll never be able to answer as to why well, they would take Let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, Nehru had a tribal affairs advisor for the Northeast. He was a missionary. <laughs> you know, he, he was, a, um, okay, this is an anecdotal thing. I don't have any proof, no written thing. There were, there was a Congress working committee meeting in the early 40s. And, and mm. the Pakistan idea had taken root. And, and Congress was trying to counter that by saying that, look, we have very, very solid support from the Muslim community. So mm. the working committee members asked, you know, yeah, come on, who is the nationalist Muslim with the uh, Congress party? And Sadhar Patel came fat with the answer. He said, the only nationalist Muslim I know is Nehru. Now you make whatever you want of it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, it's true, you know, a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of these problems came from this lack of understanding and uh, also this uh, inter, you know, sort of, we had this misunderstanding that westernization was modern and therefore we kept these values at a higher level than our own values. And this was one of the problems with Nehru's policies, even in the Northeast. And the gentleman who asked about Macaulay, I'll need a complete session, you know, so I don't <laughs> need to be, 
I, I don't mean to be rude and not answer the question here. Yes, you know, but yes. I would need, you know, you can read about it, but I would need a whole session on that because this is what happened. Nehru held Western values to such a high degree, you know, that uh, the conversion of tribal communities also was him saying that let's bring, you know, let's bring them out from um, this sort of uh, uh, darkness into light and that light could only be given by uh, the Western values that we impart, you know, Western education systems. Uh, let me also say this, that uh, uh, this uh, Western education system and this Western values that we talk about, um, we have even today a confusion about it. For example, I find a lot of people calling themselves pagans. Why are you calling yourself pagans? You know, pagans was what the missionaries used for people who they felt had absolutely Nehru uh, called himself a pagan because he said, you know, I am so westernized and I don't follow, you know, the exact values of what has been given to me. You know, so you call yourself pagans, you're calling yourself from a discriminatory lens that the colonialists gave you. And people even who were anti or who created some of the greatest divisions in India, like Herbert Hope Risley, you know, who were in charge of the census and had, you know, the bifurcations made on a, a caste, a caste based uh, census. Uh, he himself said, he said, there's a huge difference between pagans and Hindus because Hindus, uh, even if a man is illiterate, uh, will have the philosophical and scriptural understanding to talk about very deep things like life and death. There was no uh, scriptural base, philosophical base of pagans within the Roman Empire. You know, uh, uh, paganism was just a word that really meant somebody who lived in the rural area and who wasn't, uh, who wasn't, uh, uh, who wasn't modern enough, who wasn't evolved enough like the Christians were. You know, so. Uh, we still carry this nomenclature with us. We still apply it to ourselves. And all of this emanates from our education system because the social sciences are taken lightly. And subjects through which we study society, like anthropology or sociology, again, coming back to the education system and what people like Macaulay and Grizzly uh, promoted, you know, these are colonial subjects. So we are still studying ourselves through the lens of the other. Yes, yes, very true, very true. Wow, time just flew, one hour, ten minutes, one hour, eight minutes almost. And Ramiji, uh, my heartfelt thanks to you. You've been traveling a lot. And I'm, I'm sorry I missed the other date. It just, uh, it's one Not of those things where scheduling becomes I'm, difficult. I'm completely sleep deprived. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we did this, uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, I, as usual, I'm very grateful to you to, you know, because you continue keeping an eye on the Northeast and uh, talking about the problems in the Northeast. And I think that's uh, the need of the hour. Maybe uh, very soon we can talk about the great things happening in the Northeast as well. Like Absolutely. Looking forward to it. percent reduction in insurgency since 2014. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Don't forget to put the like button. I want Ramiji to come back and say, I want to be on P Guru's channel again. Thank you so much, Ramiji. Namaskar. Namaskar.